We're gonna go ahead and get started with a with a new song. It's only about 500 years old. I think about 500 years old, somewhere around there. But the truth remains, nonetheless. Let's stand. Fortresses are God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood, a mortal is prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. With cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. Did, did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? that may be Christ Jesus it is he the Lord of hosts his name from age to age the same and he must win the battle a mighty fortress a rock King of glory forever, amen. For endless ages, enthroned in praises, the King of glory forever, amen. The word above all earthly no thanks to them abided. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through Him who with us sided. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. The uh, September the 11th, we're going to our new schedule. Uh, we've been on summer schedule uh, this uh, all summer long, and September 11th, Sunday uh, school will start at 9.30 to 10.30, and the main service will be at 10.45, so get that on your schedules. Uh, Women's Com Ministry Committee is uh, reconvening the, in the new year. If you're interested in joining that committee, please see Debbie Beisline right over here. You can go see her later if you want. You can come up now. Ladies Retreat is also coming up at the end of September, the 23rd through the 25th. Uh, if you notice on the, in the bulletin, it says have the, your uh, applications in by the 28th, which is today. So 
If you have not handed it in, please get that handed in today so they can uh, finish their planning. Uh, Sunday School Christmas program is also coming up, and um, uh, Debbie Weisslein is again the contact point for that, and they'll be practicing each week and having some, some uh, lines from the script and things they're going to be learning for the, for the program, so see Debbie about that. Ladies Bible Study, Wednesday, September 21st, 9 a.m. They started a new Bible study. Uh, please uh, pray for that uh, process. If you would like to join that, speak to Debbie Weisslein or Shayla Rainwater if you have questions. Are there any other announcements? No? Well, we did it. All right. Let's stand.
I really like that part in that song, or the whole song. You know, it's it's a very broad, um, you know, talking about creation, water, earth, sky, heavens, galaxy, universe. Um, and there's that one line in there, "Father, hold me." It's um, much more personal that way, I guess, with uh, you know, coming from the you know, God of all creation to uh, the God that's living in my heart. i 
chosen me. Your love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. is asked that we read Philippians 2, 5 through 11. It reminds me of the song that we sang just before this last one. I'm here to worship, to bow down before our God. So Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Okay. Yeah, perfect. You guys can see it. Awesome. Well, um, before we get started, uh, I found it really difficult Sometimes, sometimes it's really clear what the Lord's trying to say in a passage and what, what I don't know, when you prepare a message, um, for those of you guys who have or those of you guys who have spoken in front, like sometimes the, it's just really clear. Um, this week, uh, it was not so clear. Um, I was thinking of this issue of work because that's the passage we're coming to if you're following along in Thessalonians and reading along with us. Um, today we come to this passage on idleness and work. And uh, I was trying to think, I was on a walk um, through my neighborhood and trying to think a little bit about why, 
why is it so hard um, to prepare this? Uh, I think it, it's twofold for me, at least. Um, you know, I think the topic of work is really an immense topic, both in our in, in scripture and in life. Um, we spend the majority of our waking, productive hours working. Um, even in scripture, um, God spends six out of seven days working. Um, and I think, secondly, it was hard to, to really look at this topic because there's a lot of cultural baggage for me and I think generally in the United States um, for how we value or don't value certain types of work. Um, so uh, my hope is that as we look at the scriptures, um, that the Lord would speak through me and that you guys could be encouraged no matter the stage of life you're in, whether you're a little kid um, working at home uh, or whether you're retired or in somewhere in between. Uh, the passage is on the screen, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 13. We're going to read through the whole thing, then we'll pray, and then we'll dive right in. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we did not have the right, but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some of you, among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Let's pray. Father God, these are your words penned through Paul to this, and his companions to the church in Thessalonians, and, and they are spoken to us today too. Um, you say in your, in your word that your, that your words do not return to you fruitless, and we pray that they would bear fruit in our hearts, that you would reach into our minds and hearts and calm us, uh, that we'd be able to focus this morning on what you have to say our Heavenly Father, uh, and then we would leave this meeting, um, we leave this meeting changed, that your spirit would bear fruit um, from these words you have spoken to us, and that we would, as a body together, um, leave a better representation of you, a closer image of you, Jesus. Amen. So we're wrapping up this letter to the Thessalonian church. We've uh, gone through the letter, the first letter to the Thessalonians and the second letter to the Thessalonians. And I want to remind you that when you look at this portion of Scripture, um, when you look at the Paul or, or Peter or others' letters, that it's in, or James, you want to look at a couple of questions. We want to consider the question, what were the believers struggling with that made the author write these words? It's important to remember that the Scriptures are... Um, they're authoritative for us, but they were written to a specific time. And so we're, we're reading someone else's mail, learning from their example. Not, it's not, the scripture isn't just a manual for us to open up and say, okay, according to you know, paragraph 3, subsection 4, I need to do this today. But that they're read in context. So we want to ask ourselves, to the best of our ability, what were the believers struggling with that made the author write these words? We also want to ask ourselves, how can we see the gospel at work? Not just in the teaching of, of the words on the page, but in the example of the two peoples who are interacting over this letter. And we'll see that this morning. And then lastly, we want to see, are there any commands or principles we can take away from their experience? Sometimes it's very clear what Scripture is saying to them and what Scripture is saying to us. Sometimes the clarity is a little harder and takes a little bit more work on our place to, 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 to come up with. Um, but be encouraged. We have the Holy Spirit. And these words were written in, in a narrative and historical context for a reason. 
So I say these things, I know I, I say these things oftentimes to you guys, but I think it's important because sometimes we fall into that habit. When I do my Bible reading, it's not like I spend, um, I can all, often make the time to read an entire letter in one sitting. Sometimes I might read a chapter or two, and it's easy to kind of come up with this expression of that these are, these are sayings that I'm just going to incorpor- incorporate in my life. And, and I think that, that loses a little bit of their authority rather than gains authority. I hope, hopefully, hopefully this... Um, as we look at Thessalonians together, we can, we, can, um, we can experience that this morning. Okay, so this is the map I showed you guys the last time I was up here, and we, we talked about the first letter to Thessalonians, and it's pretty relevant. Um, you'll see that Thessalonica is a city in what is um, kind of the Grecian peninsula there, um, and uh, it's right in between Philippi and Berea, and it's north of Achaia, which is where Corinth was located. And the reason I show you this map is because it could be that in Paul's mind, as he's writing this letter to the Thessalonian believers, that he's also thinking of the church in Philippi. And he's also thinking of the church in Berea. And he's also thinking of the church in Corinth. In fact, in one of the letters, he commands the Thessalonian believers to have this letter read in the other churches. And we're not clear as to what churches he's speaking of. It could be other churches in Thessalonica, but it could be other regional churches that they would pass these letters along because they were particularly inspiring and the believers would circulate this teaching together because it says in Scripture that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. The reason I bring this up is because as you read the letters to the Philippians and as you read the letters to the Corinthians, you see that some of the themes tend to overlap in Paul's writings. That when he talks about being idle or when he talks about avoiding uh, brothers who are caught in sin, um, that these things happen in both contexts. And especially today when he talks about the idea of work and money, um, that's that's a really heavy theme in his letter to the Corinthian believers. The Corinthian church seemed to struggle with the idea that Paul would work as a tent maker during the day and a preacher at night, and instead preferred teachers who took a regular salary for their ministry. Um, I want to touch on a couple of key verses that he's already written about in his previous letter to the Thessalonians, because this issue that we come to this morning is not a new issue for this church, and so it's important that we remember this. He says in chapter one, I didn't come to you or we didn't come to you because he writes, uh, there's not just Paul writing here, but we didn't come to you with the words of flattery or a pretext of greed or glory, but we're gentle among them. We spoke to please God, not men who test our hearts, nor did we seek glory. And this is um, my note, which seems to go hand in hand with money, nor did we seek, nor did we seek glory from people but we were gentle like a nursing mother, sharing ourselves. He writes later, For you remember, brothers and sisters, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim the gospel of God. Again, he writes, But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. And then lastly in the letter, respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in the Lord because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Paul and his companions had identified that idleness was something that the Thessalonian believers had already been struggling with and he had already encouraged them to obey in this area, to follow his example. Just like Jesus came, not just as a prince who didn't work and as he had a trade and he worked for um, his own needs and, and uh, had a period of ministry, Paul too valued this idea of work and modeled it to the believers. So what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to look at the instructions to these Thessalonian believers in detail and then I want to pause and afterwards I want to take a moment to ask us, is this something that we can then draw from their example to ourselves? Okay? Let's give it a go. So, this is written, a letter, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy, depending on your translation, write this letter, and they, they, they start with this. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. These believers are speaking not just from their own authority. This isn't just Paul. This isn't just Paul, Silas, and Timothy. 
They're speaking from the authority of Jesus. They use the phrase, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I came to you in the name of a prominent king or official or, or business person, okay, or, or today if, if I signed in somebody's name, it would be as if that person was lending their authority to me temporarily uh, to accomplish some purpose. And so Paul, Timothy, and Silas are writing from the authority of the Lord. This is parallels, if you think about it, to Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Or where he speaks to Peter, behold, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The church of God gathered has the authority and represents Jesus in a way. He gives this command, that you keep away from any brother. What does this phrase, keep away, mean from? Well, Paul uses similar language in some of his other letters. In 1 Corinthians 5, he says that you are to keep away from a, this brother who's having an uh, inappropriate relationship with his uh, mother-in-law. Uh, in Romans 16, false teachers or people who create divisions and obstacles were called to keep away from these people, to avoid them. In 1 Timothy 1, he speaks of Hymenaeus and another guy that I can't remember his name. And he says, these are false teachers who have handed over to Satan, excluding them from fellowship. Titus 3, one who stirs up division is to be avoided. And 2 Timothy 3 lists a long list of people who we are to avoid, people who are practicing particular sins and unrepentant. In some cases, Paul seems to say that these people have left the faith. In others, it seems that they are believers, yet unrepentant. But in all cases, Paul calls for a holiness for the church, that when someone comes to the body and is unrepentant in this way, that, they would, that we would remove ourselves from them after a time. He says later, who is walking in idleness? So which brothers should we keep away from? But the one who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that we have, you have received from us. For you ourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Paul's teaching here is very clear. Um, we are called to work for our own needs, and certainly not to be idle. This was not just his teaching, but this was his practice. This is really encouraging to me as a teacher. You know, a lot of people come to my math class and they say, Mr. Lauer, when am I ever going to use this in my life? Right? That's the phrase that they ask me. I was asked that, Linda, I saw them at the, um, at, we were down in Canby, and she asked me yesterday, but is it really practical, this algebra you speak of? And to be fair, there are times when we teach things in algebra class that you will not use in your life outside of algebra class. But uh, I have a reason for it that I won't go into because this isn't algebra class. But a really effective teacher, one who really knows his stuff or her stuff, is one who not only teaches but practices the very thing that they teach. It's really easy to get into this place as a, as a teacher to be removed from the curriculum, you know, to, to study for study's sake. And in many ways, we think of learning that way, that I'm going to go to my ivory tower, I'm going to learn this up real good, and then I'm going to come and I'm going to deliver it to you. But Paul was not this kind of teacher. Paul not only preached, but he lived this very work. He speaks of modeling this skill. And if you read through Acts, it's very clear that he took, especially in his time in Thessalonica, it seems like the time he spoke preaching and teaching in the church was mostly on the Sabbath in the synagogue. That during the rest of the week, he was quite busy. Um, he was a tent maker by trade. I have no idea how to make tents to do them well, but, I'm, but it's, it's not a very glorious profession. And he worked hard with his hands to provide for his own needs so that he would have not just an example, but that so that he wouldn't burden the church with providing for his needs, so that on the Sabbath, when he came to synagogue, that he could focus on this ministry, this time of equipping very directly their spiritual needs. Meanwhile, during the week, he was setting an example for them in the Lord. Much of the work we remember Paul for doing, or we think of Paul as a famous apostle for, was probably stuff he did on nights and weekends. I want to pause here and, and think about us for a minute here. As we think about the believers in Thessalonica, do we value holiness 
similarly to how Paul, Timothy, and Silas encouraged these Thessalonian believers to value holiness. Do we dabble in sin? Do we tolerate it? Um, certainly there are things within our own lives that we were, are going to continue to struggle with, but do we tolerate unrepentant sin in our own lives? Do we encourage those around us in this body to turn from sin and be delivered? Do we really believe that the wages of sin is death? Or do we just think of it as, ah, well, I've got my Jesus and I'm going to go to heaven, so I'm good and I can kind of live how I want. I'm not going to answer these questions for you guys. These are somewhat rhetorical, but I do want you to pause and think about, as a body, how are we doing? Do we value as a body work or you in your own life that provides for your needs? Um, similarly to how Paul and his companions valued their work. Do we have the same goals that Paul and his companions have when we get off work? I know that when I'm done with a day of work at school that there is a very strong temptation to relax. My work is done. Time for fun. But do we then think of it as an opportunity? I'm done with the work for the day. How can I bless those around me? Or how can I use my work during the day as a blessing to those around me? Do our ministry and secular work, or ministry work and secular work, provide an example of the gospel? Like Paul and his companions work and ministry provide an example from the gospel. Or do we tend to compartmentalize it, thinking, okay, now it's my working time and Later will be my ministry time, and I'll work while I work, and I'll minister while I minister. How are, we, how are we doing there? And then lastly, if we think about this, it's really, really tempting for me, and I, I had to go through my notes and delete every time I wrote just Paul, because Paul writes as a team. Do we think of ministry, or do we think of work as something that we do alone? Or do we do this in community, valuing the fact that the body is the bride, not just one us individually, that we are the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the members of one another. Okay, I like this quote. This was written by uh, a woman, Courtney Rysick. She writes um, the book Glory in the Ordinary. Um, I appreciated it especially. Uh, many of you know that uh, we just spent a year in Mexico where I wasn't working for paid work. And then prior to that, I, I took a couple of years off from my teaching job. Uh, where I was mostly the parent at home, and my wife was the wage earner. Um, this book, Glory in the Ordinary, um, she writes a couple of things. One, I think, um, is hard to articulate. Um, I'm backing up here because I'm looking at my notes. But she writes that the value of someone's work in the kingdom is not how much they receive for what they do, but in how much they build others up. But I wanted to read to you this second quote. She writes, For the most part, if you live in Western society, you are going it alone. She encourages moms not just to seek out community on the internet or among other mommy bloggers, but to seek out other real presences in real time. You and I were not meant to be alone, she writes. We were not meant to work alone. And she's writing especially to, to women who tend to be the ones in our, community, in our culture who, who stay at home and, and do a lot of work. And I know not every mom is able to do that. Um, and so I'm not condemning or, or, or holding up stay-at-home moms is this, this example of extra godliness, but it tends to be that the, the responsibilities of parenthood oftentimes fall more heavily on a woman's shoulders, and that work in our culture tends to be devalued in a lot of ways that work outside the home isn't as devalued. For instance, no, uh, you can hire someone to come into your house and and fold the laundry and prepare your meals and, 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 and do the housework, the homemaking sort of things. You can even hire someone to come and raise your kids for you. And not to say that those things are bad necessarily, but it's, we value those things financially from a cultural point of view, from a worldly point of view, much lower than we value things that you have to go to college to accomplish or to get a higher level of education, okay? Or that you have to work your way up on a, in a corporate setting. And we need to be aware of those culture, cultural pieces for ourselves because we're not called to value work like that in the kingdom of God. So I want to dive back here in the passage, the back half of the passage. Um, Paul mentions that he and his companions have a right to be paid for their labors, and we'll read here. He says, It was not because we do not have that right, 
but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Paul suggests in other writings, he writes that do not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. In other writings, he suggests that as an apostle, as someone who labors among the churches, he and his companions have the right to take a salary, but he forgoes that right in order to provide for these believers a good example of what ministry life should look like. Um, you and I should not consider, I mean, as we think about practical applications here, but we should not consider that ministry is only something we're willing to do for financial gain. And Paul was writing to kind of combat that and living to combat that impression that was early on a part of ministry life in the churches of the first and second century, that many people were only willing to do ministry for financial gain or for the gain of prestige. It's also telling that Paul uses the phrase willing. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Like in this body, perhaps in, in the body of Thessalonica, there might have been some who were willing to work but unable to do so for various reasons. Perhaps they were too young. Perhaps their body was broken in some way. Perhaps they were too old to put in the same amount of work that they might have done previously. But Paul writes this idea because in a moment he's going to come to somebody who's very clearly not working and very able to work. Timothy, Silas, and Paul don't seem to be talking about people who are unable for some reason to, to be able to work, but speaking to someone who, or some ones, who are not willing and not busying themselves with providing for their own needs. For we hear some, excuse me, for we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. This word busy bodies, or the word work, um, just uh, in, the, in the Greek, it, the word work and make and do, they, they all the same thing. Uh, it's kind of similar to the word in Spanish. Um, if you've ever heard hacer, the, I thought Willie and Nikki would be here. I thought they'd love that part, but they're not here yet. Um, they're in town. You should visit them if you see them or hear from them. But the word hacer in Spanish means to make or to do. Um, and we have different words in English. You know, I make my bed. I do my homework. It's kind of confusing, actually, to try to explain to a Spanish speaker the difference between when you make something and when you do something. Um, but this idea, this, wor this idea of work is to, to get something accomplished. And apparently there were some who were going from house to house and they were busying themselves with nothing. Um, this, this word uh, idle, the earlier word idle, is sometimes translated disorderly. Um, it's been said in our culture that idle hands are the devil's workshop. I, mean, you guys, I don't know if you've heard that phrase before. Um, but they weren't just doing nothing. They were stirring up problems. They were causing issues with their nothingness. The, the nothing that they were doing, they were getting into sort of trouble, and they weren't just, their trouble was spreading among the church. It could be that like the preachers in 1 Corinthians, uh, that they were demanding funds or, or prestige. Maybe the reason they were not working was because they were waiting for the Lord Jesus to come back because they were convinced he had come back already or that this was imminent, and so what's the point in doing anything because it's all going to burn? Um, but they were meddlers. They were stirring up trouble. And this distinction is that they were not, they, this was somehow not quiet, right? This was a loud sort of activity. It was obvious, it was disruptive, and Paul and his companions speak against it. And then they pause here and they encourage the rest of the believers and they say, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So you see the contrast between the previous passage where these believers are walking around doing nothing, accomplishing nothing, meddling and causing trouble, and this encouragement of Paul not for these other believers who are observing this conflict to stop working. You know, I am not to be jealous and, and as a Thessalonian believer of this preacher who's going from house to house and getting free food 
and prestige and to be like, you know what? I want to be like that guy. Okay? How did he? That's, he's, he's gamed the system. Okay? And so Paul's saying, no, don't grow weary in doing good. And if, you're, if someone is, is not obeying what we say in this letter, if they're ignoring this encouragement that we have, this example that we set, that we receive from the Lord, he says twice under the authority of Jesus, he says, we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone would just take the Lord Jesus' authority and just put it on the shelf, you know what, I know better than the Lord Jesus, and I'm going to do things my way, then Paul says, have nothing to do with that person. This unrepentant believer is not following in the footsteps of Jesus. Step away from them. Don't associate with them. Not so that this person would be ruined or punished, but that they would be ashamed. Listen to his, his, his prior. He says, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. I'm reading this book. I'm not done with it yet, so I can't recommend it to you guys yet. <clears throat> I don't even know the author that well either, so I'm a little hesitant to even talk about it. But the idea of this author, and I, I really am encouraged by this example of Jesus, is that when someone is repentant in the New Testament, you think about the example of the prodigal son and the father. When someone is repentant, you see a father who is tender and willing to forgive and very quick to forgive in our Heavenly Father. But when someone is unrepentant in the New Testament, when someone refuses, even though they are warned in love to stop sinning, to stop investing their life in something that will destroy them and others, God oftentimes patiently and then eventually warns and then punishes. He brings us back to himself. He gives us things that are uncomfortable and painful, that we would repent and turn from our sin, which will eventually destroy us. And these things which are hard and not fun and sometimes cause us to think, what are you doing, God? They are designed to bring us back to him. And Paul, likewise, is, is asking the church to do something very hard and very painful in avoiding these people so that they would be ashamed of what they're doing and so that they would turn from their sin in the church and they would be better for it. It's not an easy thing that Paul is asking, but he is, he is calling them to holiness. I think of that idea as I parent my own children. And I confess to my kids, oh, probably two or three weeks ago when I started reading this idea that sometimes even after they've repented, my desire is to punish them, to teach them a lesson. And that's not the same practice as my Heavenly Father. When my Heavenly Father sees that I've repented, he turns and forgives me. But when I'm not repentant, then then I receive the, the punishments, the, the things that are designed to bring me back to him in love. So back to this idea of how does this apply to us? Thinking of the example of Paul and these other believers, do we overvalue or undervalue paid ministry? It's really easy today to get onto YouTube or whatever medium you choose to listen to and to listen to someone who's paid a lot of money to preach a sermon once a week, and that's basically their job. How do we value unpaid ministry? What are our expectations to those, for those who minister to us in the Lord? Um, you know, I'm very thankful for the example we hear of at OCBC. In case you're not aware, um, we don't have a pastor here at OCBC, and we have a group of elders and none of us receive a salary or, or financial compensation for our work. Um, that's not to say that our example should be something we foist upon other churches and we should hold ourselves as the primo example of Jesus. But I'm very thankful that that is our practice. Um, I'm thankful because in our body it allows us the flexibility to support more mission work. And it allows us to remember that none of us elders is the head of this body that we are parts of the body, and that we have one head, and that's Jesus Christ. And as we seek to work in the community, or as we have worked, because some of, some of the elders in the past have been retired, um, our desire is to have a testimony, both in the community and in the church, that our work is also important. And I value the different perspectives of the other elder team 
other members of the elder team, and that they have jobs, and they provide for their needs, and they provide for the needs of not just themselves, but others, and they bless others with their finances. And that's a real encouragement to me as, as I likewise seek to strive after the example of Jesus. Another question we might ask is, how do we measure our work in the Lord? Do we measure it by our salary? For those of us who have jobs that pay a salary, do we measure it by how much we get accomplished? Uh, do we measure it by whether it's holy work or not? Um, or by whether it stays done? Uh, some of you can relate to that. Um, uh, you know, I just did these dishes, why are they all dirty? Or I folded all the laundry and then you knocked over the pile. Now I have to fold it again. Uh, not too long ago, my wife made a really tasty looking curry and um, we went to the park uh, to visit with some friends who maybe would give us a ride to back and forth to school. We were figuring something out. And we set the curry on the, on the counter and then um, we accidentally let the dog in the, the room and She's quite big if you haven't met my dog yet. Um, and within, you know, 120 seconds, she had devoured the whole curry um, and the bowl was empty. And so do, do I think of my wife's dinner that she made as worthless work? Um, how does the Lord view that work she did, even though it was undone very quickly and rapidly? And the dog for sure enjoyed the lunch, but to be fair, we don't like to feed our dog human food. One bias in our culture that really runs deep is this, this idea that the value of a service is tied to the amount of money that we're willing to pay for that service. But in God's economy, where the greatest among us are the least, I would encourage you to consider that the value of some services seems to be more in line with how we're meeting the needs of others. Am I, in my work, blessing others? Can I be more of a blessing to those around me, whether I'm repairing old dysfunctional, dysfunctional equipment or whether I'm working with little people who make big messes, how can I be a blessing to those around me? Another question we might ask is, how do we balance work and rest? Are we abusing periods of rest? Do we rest like Paul's companions to make time for others? Does our work bless others? I think there is a tendency for some of us to not rest, to think of I, you know, that passage where Paul talks about how to, he encourages the Colossian believers to do all things for the glory of God and to think that I must always be working to glorify God. And for others, we think of, no, I, I deserve my rest. I have accomplished what I needed to accomplish for today, and I may sit, and I, may not, I don't have to be bothered. We have flesh, right? We struggle. Um, I'd encourage you to consider that. I had to think a lot about this um, during uh, my time off from work. I naturally do well with a structure. I am super excited about the school year to begin. I get a schedule again. I have to be at work at a certain time and I get to leave at a certain time and there are certain responsibilities. And if I don't know my stuff, I have 30 eighth graders who are going to very clearly and very quickly let me know that my lesson plan was not done well enough. So I have to get it all ready. There's lots of natural incentive, or unnatural, very structured incentives um, for me as a, as a school teacher. When I get home and the dishes aren't done or the, the meals need done, or the, there's not as many natural incentives at home to get work done. Parenting is a lot harder. It's not as clear as, as, a, as a parent uh, to, to know when the work is accomplished, how to it's, you know, there's not like a bar or, or papers that I can move from one side of my desk to the other to, to say that. And, and, and I love doing that work, but it's not as clear. Some of, our, some of our work is clear and when it's accomplished, and other times it's not. We have to use, or we have to listen to the Holy Spirit to know um, how we can glorify him in that way. Um, you know, another thing we've thought about recently is, is budgeting. Um, Thank you very much for those of you guys who, I want to say again, who blessed us with uh, uh, pantry food. That was a great help to us. Um, as we've transitioned back to the States, our budget has changed significantly. Um, tacos can no longer be had for a dollar. You have to pay like three or four a piece. And, and food is a little bit more expensive, and as is gasoline. And, and then there are other things like home improvement repairs that are exciting to do and very expensive. Um, but we've also thought about budgeting our time. 
Um, how am I, now that life is a little bit different, how am I managing my time well? Um, am I working so much that I'm not available to bless others? Um, am I using my rest time? Okay, you get the question. You can consider that yourselves. And then lastly, I want to ask this question. Are we more focused on other successes or the approval, excuse me, are we focused on others, on our successes or the approval of the Lord in our work? That question was phrased poorly on my PowerPoint. Um, as I, you know, sometimes we, we have a new home and I, I think about the projects I need to accomplish. The other day I was in my garage and it's a little bit messy. I don't know if any of you have messy garages. Um, but I sat there and I thought, I was talking to my friend about this, like there's a bunch of scrap wood in the back of the yard and I want to stack that in a little thing. But first I need to build a lumber rack. But before I build the lumber rack, I got to move the sheets of plywood that are sitting in front of the mirror. And before I move the sheets of plywood, I ought to build something with them. And so I'm just caught in this like circle of like, uh, I don't know, ah, uh, just forget it. I'll just go back inside my house. My garage can stay messy. Um, and if I'm not accomplishing anything, sometimes I feel like I really am not working or doing anything. Or sometimes it's also very much a temptation for myself to, to think of how, how do others view my work that I'm, I'm doing. You know, I have a new boss at, at Baker Prairie where we're going to work next year. Uh, is she thinking I'm doing a good job? If she's thinking I'm doing it, whew, then I'm good. But also I, or I need to pause on her expectations or, and, and really think, what does the Lord consider about the work that I'm doing? How does he value my work? How does he value your work? Do you pause for a moment and ask the Lord, Lord, how am I doing in this area? If we could summarize, if I could summarize this passage in, in one question to go home and ask yourself this evening or this afternoon, um, it would be this. Does the way you work model the gospel and glorify the Lord? Paul places uh, our work of high importance, but not necessarily in the ways we might think. If you're convicted later today or this week that this is an area you need to grow in, I would encourage you strongly to find someone else to grow alongside. Don't think of this as something you just need to get yourself together in, and then you can come and be a part of the body. But find someone who can, in the Lord, keep you accountable James, in his letter to the various churches, writes, We all stumble in many ways. And later talks about wisdom. Wisdom is sincere and humble. This is an area I would like to grow in. I would like my work to glorify the Lord and to model the gospel. And I would encourage you, if this is an area you would like to grow in, and to find some brothers and sisters in the Lord who are trustworthy and to grow alongside them in this area. Do not try to go it alone. That wasn't Paul's example. That wasn't even Jesus' example. And he was God's own son. I want to close with this passage here as we come to the Lord's table. We read earlier in Philippians 2 of Jesus' example of taking off his glory and setting it aside to come to earth. Paul writes later in the very same letter, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights of the world holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. As we come to the Lord's Supper, we can be encouraged that this is one work that is accomplished. When Jesus died on the cross prior to his death, he said, it is finished. Your place at the wedding supper of the Lamb 
is bought and paid for. That work is done. That laundry pile is never getting upset. But we have a choice. When we come to this table, we're proclaiming to the Lord Jesus, Lord, I, like you, will die to myself that I might rise with you. So I'd encourage you, if that's not where you're at, if, if, if you're not at a place where you're not, you don't want to die, you, you want to run things your own way, you want to define good and evil on your own terms, pause, just abstain from the Lord's Supper. I'd encourage you to go home and consider it. I think, and the word promises, that in the Lord's hand is pleasure forevermore, that the Lord is, he, is, he has given us a beautiful inheritance. But don't just go through the motions. This is a promise before the Lord that, that you, he's your Lord before Jesus. Whether or not you would reject his work or, or accept his work accomplished on your behalf. Let's close our time in prayer. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, we are thankful for your presence, for your work accomplished in our lives, that you, you are not a God who has abandoned us to our own selves. You do not ask us to come and to find you. You have revealed yourself to us. If anything, Lord, we know that we have rejected you, that we, have, we are all very guilty of, of, of crafting our own image of good and evil. And to the degree to which this morning we harbor any of that, we want to repent of that sin, to turn from it, to, to declare to you that we trust you, that we know that you have good for us, prepared for us, that you have done good work, that you continue to do good work for us. And we pray that you would open our hearts to meditate further, that you would ingrain this word, that you would burn these words deep into us, Lord, that we would follow your example. And that by your spirit and your presence that we would bear good fruit in the work that we have been prepared to do. Thank you that we get to be a part of your family, that we are not slaves or servants, but that you have called us your brothers and sisters in the Lord, that we have been called your bride, that you have drawn us near. You have brought us up. Even as you came down and are glorified now, Lord, we are guaranteed by your great grace and mercy to have a place with you in heaven in our final and forever home. And so these few days that we spend on this earth, we pray that you would encourage us to be faithful, to proclaim your promises, to speak clearly our, our thanks to you, our Father, and to be changed. We know this is your work to do in us, not, uh, yeah, and, and, and we just, we're just really thankful for, to, be, to be your children. Please bless the rest of our time together, Lord, and encourage us as we go forth. Um, amen. There's a website out there uh, called the Berean Test. Um, in case you're curious, the way we evaluate songs to share with the congregation, I use this website a lot um, because it's a group of believers that has gone through now hundreds and hundreds of worship songs for the purpose of evaluating whether it's a good criteria or whether it be a good criteria to do it in corporate worship, right? So there's three, three criteria they use. One is, it, is, it, is it singable by a congregation? Not all songs, some are complicated lyrically or rhythmically, so you can't do them. Secondly, most importantly, probably is, is it in alignment with God's word? And, the, and they go line by line and pull out scriptures. It's very helpful for me when I'm looking at that as well. Third is an interesting one. It's how would this song sound to somebody who did not know anything about Christianity, knew nothing about God? Um, and in more modern songs, say 1970 and, and beyond, those songs are becoming really rare. It's hard to find songs that com clearly communicate the gospel message without using a lot of uh, rhetoric. Or, um, but this this is a song that scores very highly, and I was going to read it to you. I know we're going to sing it, but it, it sounds different when you read it. Very simple message. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names. Precious Lamb of God, Messiah, hope for sinners slain. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. And there I'll serve my king forever in that holy place. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your son. 
and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. Let's stand. to us about, about our Lord. In 1 John chapter 3, um, verse 8, it says, He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of Man of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. We do have a Redeemer. It's 
It's my joy to talk. 